Hi everyone, welcome back to Carpe Diem Sailing. Thanks for joining me. If you're new to the channel, my name is Marco. I'm a Sail Canada cruising instructor. And in today's video, I'll be talking about pre-departure checks and preparation. Welcome to episode 33, Pre-Departure Checks. For show notes and helpful checklists, please go to www.carpediumsailing.com slash show notes. I have included a link in the description below. And now, let's get started. In chapter 16, Emergencies of the Annapolis Book of Seamanship, author John Rumanier talks about a formula for disaster. The formula for disaster are seven factors that have been identified in marine emergencies. Not all seven factors have to be at play in order to contribute to a marine emergency. There might be two or three of them. We're going to talk about three of them in this video. First, we're going to talk about a rushed, ill-considered departure. So that might mean that you're feeling anxious, you just want to get going. And I've certainly been there back in, the, in my early days. Um, you know, the wind is blowing, whistling in the rigging a little bit, and you're feeling a little bit of pressure and you just want to get going. And I've done that. I don't do that anymore. So take the time to prepare yourself properly, especially if you're expecting a bit of heavy weather. The second and third that we're going to talk about is an unprepared crew and an unprepared boat. So a lot of what we're talking about here is checks and preparation before you untie the lines and take off. There are four rules for preparing for departure. Prepare the boat, prepare the crew, choose a safe route, and prepare for emergencies. So have some contingency plans. A lot of what we're going to talk about when we do our walkthrough on, above on, on deck is getting ready for those sorts of emergencies, having some backup contingency plans. Also, I want to say that this is an entry level sort of prep check preparation. And then from here, this is, you know, consider this as a, a prep or check for day sailing purposes. If you're going out on longer cruise overnight passages or blue water passages, obviously there's going to be more checks that you're going to include. So use this as a foundation to build on and then develop your own lists down, down the line. So I will have lists, um, this checklist, things like that in our show notes. Feel free to download those from our, our website. I won't be covering things like harnesses, jack lines, that sort of thing. I hope to do a video in the future on harnesses and jack lines but, uh, and heavy weather sailing. But for now, let's just use this as a foundation. So to start with, um, when I, with my own students, what I like to do is look at personal prep. So first of all, we'll look at <coughs> excuse me, um, dressing properly for the conditions. So if it's wet and windy, make sure you have proper foul weather gear, deck boots, that sort of thing, and you're warm enough. Um, if it's hot and sunny, then have appropriate protection from the sun. So hats, sunglasses, things like that. Um, sunscreen. Um, PFDs as well. Inflatable PFDs are quite comfortable in warmer weather. Um, so we never leave the dock now without having our PFDs on. And we wear the PFDs at all times. Other things are things like, like sailing gloves. So I don't typically wear them all that often, but they do protect your hands from um, rope burn, from handling the lines, that sort of thing. The last thing I'm going to talk about when it comes to personal uh, protection or personal preparation is seasickness. So even on a nice day for a day sail, people can succumb to seasickness. And the best way to prepare for seasickness is by taking medication well in advance, either over the counter, things like gravel or prescribed by your doctor. So decide what works for you and then whatever medication you take, make sure you take it well in advance. Next, we're going to talk about prepping the boat. So most, um, our good idea would be to have a safety diagram as you see here. And the diagram should be laminated and posted somewhere where everybody can see it and everybody knows where it is. Um, and take your crew through it and just brief them a little bit. So the safety diagram will typically cover where all the emergency equipment is in the boat, where things are stowed, um, things like where the through hulls are. Um, I'm lucky on this boat I only have four through hulls, but if you are taking on water um, and you're trying to bail the boat out and you're in a bit of a panic situation, knowing where those through hulls are and where there might be some water coming in is a good thing for everybody to know. So feel free to download the safety diagram from our show notes and use it as an example for, to develop your, your own and then have it on the boat. Make sure everybody knows where it is and they can see it and brief your crew 
um, as to where things are and how the safety diagram, you know, interpret the safety diagram for your crew. We're going to talk a little bit about safety equipment. Um, and the safety equipment that I'm talking about right now, safety equipment like sound signaling devices, flares, that sort of thing, uh, safety equipment that is mandated by law. So in Canada, Transport Canada uh, puts out a list of equipment that's required for different sizes of vessels that you must have. If you don't have these pieces of equipment on your boat, you could be fined for up to $200 per item. I don't know what things are like in your own country, but make sure you know and make sure you look at whatever agency you need to, to find out what minimum equipment you need to have on your boat. In Canada, the Transport, Transport Canada puts out the Safe Boating Guide. The Safe Boating Guide has a list, which is great, uh, but make sure you check and see that it is the most up-to-date information because these things do change. And if the police or the Coast Guard board you out there and they want to fine you and you say, I didn't know, it's not really an excuse. So make sure you know what minimum equipment required requirements are for you in your country, for your boat, and make sure you're up-to-date with all those requirements. There's also a list that Sail Canada puts out um, uh, that I'll have in my show notes as well, and that's recommended equipment. So recommended equipment uh, can be things like first aid kits. Uh, there are things like VHF radio used to be recommended. Compasses used to be recommended. They're now required. Technically, a VHF radio is not required, but you must carry twice as many flares if you do not have one or a cell phone with service for the areas you sail in. Uh, softwood tapered plugs in case you have a through hull failure. That's in our recommended list. And obviously, you're going to have a different list of recommendations for a an easy day sail in 10 knots of wind versus an overnight blue water passage. So once again, you can use these lists to build on as you develop your own adventures. We talked about choosing a safe route. So I'm going to talk a little bit about navigation. So one of the first things I like to do as part of my pre-departure checks or preps is to look at the tide tables and figure out whether the tide is rising or falling. It's nice to know if you do go aground, God forbid, that you're on a rising tide. It's a lot less dire than if you're on a falling tide. If you go aground on a falling tide, you need to work quickly to get the boat off and float it again. Um, if you go aground on a rising tide, you simply wait and the boat will float and off you go. So yes, nobody wants to run aground, so be careful. But at least if you've checked your tide tables, you know where it's at. You're not wasting time looking at the tide tables once you've just gone aground. You're just either working to get the boat off or you're not panicking because you know the water will, will float you up. Um, also, for us in Vancouver um, and on the BC coast, we have a lot of tidal passes. So leaving the harbour, we have to go through a narrows called First Narrows to go into English Bay, and the currents there can run up to five or six knots. There are some tidal passes on the coast that can run up to 16 knots. So once again, you can look in your tidal book. This is the official publication put out by the Government of Canada um, and uh, by the Hydrographic Service, um, and they will have tides as well as um, the currents. Now I do have a video on tides already. I'm hoping, I don't have a video yet on currents, but I do hope to have a video on currents. Remember tides go up and down, currents go in and out. So use the right table for the right situation. The other thing about navigation is, you know, we all use electronics. I love my GPS. I have Navionics on my phone. I have iNavX on my iPad, um, that sort of thing. But I also have a chart table full of paper charts and the instruments to go with it. So pencils, erasers, dividers, that sort of thing. Just have some form of manual backup just in case of an electronic failure. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the weather forecast. So before leaving, I like to obtain a proper marine weather forecast, either from the internet uh, or from a VHF radio. So the VHF radio will have uh, a weather band where you can actually go and listen to a marine forecast. The marine forecast will typically, certainly for Canada, um, Environment Canada puts them out a few times a day. And what they do is they'll give you a synopsis, which is just a general overall picture of what the weather systems are doing. Then they interpret that synopsis into an area forecast, and then they submit or uh, they give you any warnings that they might have. So small craft or strong wind warnings, which are winds in excess of 20 knots, a gale warning, storm force warning, hurricane force wind warnings. So they will give you warnings. Those warnings are based on what they're predicting, and I have found them to be quite conservative. So one thing I find that I quite like are the lighthouse weather reports. And in Canada, again, on the west coast here, we do have a series of lighthouses up and down the coast that do send out weather data. Uh, weather data. And so you can actually find out in real time what's actually happening. So for us right now, the Strait of Georgia, just across the strait, there's a little town called Nanaimo. And just outside of Nanaimo is uh, Entrance Island. 
Entrance Island is a lighthouse complex, and it has one of these lighthouse weather reports um, emanating from there. And so, you know, before leaving, it's nice to know that it's blowing 18 knots and uh, a three-foot sea or whatever. It's, uh, it's good to have an idea of what's actually happening versus what they're predicting. So I typically will listen to the lighthouse weather reports for my area or for the area that I'm going to uh, before taking off. So that's all I'm going to talk about here as far as this goes. And now let's do a walkthrough down below, and then we'll do a walkthrough up top. I like to start my checks down below from the bow and do a walkthrough back towards the stern. It always reminds me of flight attendants on a flight checking the baggage, the overhead baggage, that sort of thing. Uh, same idea, actually, uh, except here we've got other things we need to think about, like port lights and hatches. So the first thing I'll start with back here is make sure that my hatch is fully properly closed and sealed. So not locked open with a little bit of an opening that can still let water in because it's amazing how much water can come through there with to get a wave over the bow. So make sure your forward hatch is properly closed and sealed. Same thing with these port lights, make sure they're sealed, um, closed properly. I have one of these port lights in my aft cabin, which is actually below deck level, and it's actually one of my biggest nightmares that we'll forget that one day in heavy weather and we'd be heeled over, and it's amazing how much water can come out, can get come into the boat through an opening that size. So make sure all your windows, hatches, port lights are all closed before you leave the dock. Next, we're gonna talk about stowage. So stowage of items like heavy items like glass bottles, things like that. Make sure you stow them as low as possible in a small locker where they're not going to fly around, break, that sort of thing. So um, not out on shelves like this. Think of the boat on its side and anything that's going to go flying, put it away. So not only will they make a mess of the boat, um, but they're also dangerous if they should end up you know, hitting somebody. This glass bottle flying across the boat is quite, could be quite a missile. So make sure that all that stuff's put away. Um, any clothing, charts, things like that, also keep them properly stowed so they don't end up on the floor. Because once again, you need to come down here, you need to move through the boat, that sort of thing. It's hard enough underway in, in rough weather. Um, even if you're out on a day sail and you get caught, you don't need to have tripping and slipping hazards all over the floor. So keep your cabin down below neatly stowed and keep all your windows and hatches closed when you take off from the dock. So moving further back, the next thing I check is my bilge. So I make sure that my bilge is, uh, first of all, I'll check the water level. My bilge, I always have a little tiny bit of water. I have some deck leaks. I have a packing gland that leaks um, a little bit. Um, so there's always gonna be a little bit of water in there, but um, make sure you know and you're familiar with how much water should be in there for your, your boat. I have two bilge pumps. I have an electric bilge pump on an automatic float switch, and I have a manual uh, bilge pump, a big diaphragm pump out in the cockpit. Now by law, I am required to have the manual pump. I don't have to have the electric, the electric pump, uh, but I must have a manual. I have two, and before you leave, make sure your pumps are working. Make sure that your bilge is clean. Um, the Fastnet Force 9, big, biggest yachting disaster in history so far. Stories of boats not being able to be pumped because uh, so much garbage in the bilges, including tea bags, things like that. Make sure your bilges are clean, Make sure your level isn't higher than it should be. If it is, pump it out and try to determine where that water is coming from. But more importantly, make sure that there's nothing to clog those bilge pumps and make sure those pumps are working. Moving further back, again, we're just going to look at stowage, making sure everything is properly stowed. I make sure that that window back in my aft cabin is closed. And then we're going to do our engine checks. So we have an inboard uh, diesel engine in here, and we're just going to do some basic checks uh, to make sure that the engine is in reasonable condition, there aren't any leaks under underneath. Uh, make sure that your fuel is topped up. Uh, it's always important, uh, even on, with, a, with a diesel boat, keep your fuel as topped up as possible. Uh, there's all kinds of problems that can come from that. Garbage being you know, um, stirred up, clogging your, your fuel filters. Um, I had a situation a few years ago where I might have sucked in some air because the boat was rolling so much on a half tank. So I try to keep my tanks as full as possible. Um, Check all your fluid levels, your belts, things like that. I'm just gonna have a quick shot of the engine just to give you an idea. We have a little Yanmar in here, um, and then we're gonna go up above and we're gonna do our walkthrough on deck. So here we have our little Yanmar two-cylinder diesel engine. And what I'm looking for is the general, general impression of the state of the engine. I'm looking for leaks underneath, any oil or coolant leaks. I have one of those absorbent pads down below that will trap oil, but uh, will actually let water through. Belts, make sure you find the right tension for your engine. Look at your manual. 
determine what the right tension, belt tension is. Uh, make sure the belts aren't frayed, aren't about to go. Have some spares as well. Have a spare belt for your alternator and your water pump. Um, I check my hoses as well. Make sure that they're not leaking, that your hose clamps are all in the right, that they're tight and they're not leaking. Um, the hoses aren't about to burst on you. Uh, look at the fuel connections, that sort of thing. Make sure these banjos aren't leaking. Um, and then a few, you know, there's a few wiring connections here and there uh, the, on a diesel engine, not a lot of wiring, but it's just a general quick overall overview of the general state of the engine and making sure that nothing's about to let go on you. Now that I've completed my personal checks as well as the checks down below, we're going to do our checks up on deck. And again, just like with uh, down below, I start at the bow and make my way down or back to the stern. So arguably the most important item on deck, in my opinion, is to have an anchor when it comes to uh, avoiding emergencies. I have needed them in the past where um, I've been able to anchor because of steering failures, things like that, um, where I might have been washed ashore um, if I hadn't had an anchor ready to go. So on that note, make sure that you check that you have an appropriate sized anchor for your vessel. Make sure that you understand how to deploy it quickly, whether it's a manual anchor like this with a pin, uh, some kind of securing device to keep it from going over the, you know, falling over the side when you're underway, but also being able to undo it quickly. If it's a windlass, make sure you know where the, the switches are to activate it. So make sure you know how to deploy the anchor. As well, with a manual anchor like this one here, I have the chain and the rope portion or the line portion of the uh, road uh, flaked in so that it's, uh, it will deploy quickly without any tangles. Um, if I need to anchor quickly in an emergency, should I have a rudder failure, a power failure, something like that, prevent me from being drifted ashore and shipwrecked. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about with the anchor is the um, bitter end. Make sure the bitter end is actually fastened into your locker. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about getting your sails ready, and then we're going to talk about uh, checks to do in the cockpit. As I just mentioned, an anchor is uh, a very valuable piece of emergency equipment. Second to that, I feel that sails uh, play a role as well. If you're in water that's too deep to anchor um, and you're maybe you know in the path of, of shipping or something like that and you want to get out of the way, uh, certainly having your sails up quickly in case of a power failure or a, a prop uh, fouling your prop, that sort of thing, uh, can certainly uh, help get you out of you know out of some out of trouble. So for me, it's always been a rule that we never leave the dock without the main sail cover off the sail and the main halyard attached to the head of the sail and then tied down like this with that last sail tie. By tying it down like this, it holds the head of the sail down so it doesn't work its way up the mast, but we can also tension this halyard so it doesn't flop around and get caught in the spreaders. And then the sail ties, uh, as I've shown in my other videos with dealing with the main sail, it's just a quick release uh, slip knot that you can quickly undo so that you can actually have your sail up in a hurry. So that's the main sail. The head sail right now, we do have a furling head sail on this, on this boat. Uh, it's important to have the sheets run back to the winches and I like to have my furling line flaked out ready to go. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the cockpit. If you have a standard uh, or very traditional old style hanked on sail, it's worth having your sail hanked on, bagged, and then your sheets run back as well and have your halyard ready to go so that you can quickly get that up. Really important to be able to get your sails up in a hurry um, to back up any sort of an engine or propeller failure. When it comes to checks in the cockpit, um, again, I start with the minimum equipment that's required by law as well as any recommended equipment. So make sure that our bilge pump, the manual bilge pump works, the handle is kept below, make sure that the diaphragm pump is working. Uh, any equipment like ring boys or heaving lines should be on the rail where they can be quick, quickly uh, accessed. Uh, any recommended equipment like VHF radios or um, hand bearing compasses, binoculars, things like that, I like to have them out before I take off. Um, and then uh, general cleanliness and tidiness around the cockpit to prevent slipping and tripping hazards. So things like extra clothing, it's very easy on a warmer day for people just to get too hot, take a jacket off, put it in the corner somewhere, it ends up on the floor, somebody slips on it and can get hurt. Um, or you're heading out and it's cooler weather and you're expecting you might need some extra warm clothing, um, it's worth having them in a dry bag but put away in a locker. So lines, clothing, 
charts, books, things like that. Try to keep slipping and tripping hazards out from under your feet in the cockpit. Um, as well as talking about general stowage, not just in the cockpit, also on the side decks. Uh, people, especially longer range cruisers, will have fuel cans out on the side decks, things like that. Sometimes, yeah, that's necessary to do. Personally, in my cruising, I try to keep my decks as clean and clutter-free as possible. So that includes things like uh, stand-up paddle boards or dinghies, that sort of things tied to the side decks. Uh, make sure they are properly secured if you have to do that, but I do find that they get in the way of sail handling, the sh sheets get caught up on them, and then I've got to go up there and deal with it. So just be careful with your stowage. Personally, I like it to be as clutter-free as possible. So talking about sails, I'd mentioned that I have a head sail. It's a furling sail up there. My sheets are run back to the winches, and I have my furling line flaked out and ready to go, so that if I need to quickly unfurl that sail for some reason or other, then I, I need to get out of the path of a, of a ship or a boat or something like that when I have an engine failure or a prop failure. Um, it's just a matter of pulling the sheet out and unfurling the sail and I've got control of the boat. If it's uh, coiled up, you need to uncoil it, then you've got some tangles, things like that. So again, small, small detail, but it can go a long way to preventing troubles in the future. I'm going to wrap up these pre-departure checks in preparation with talking a little bit about dealing with a tender or inflatable dinghy. So for me on this boat, I'm quite fortunate that I do have davits. So the davits are these arms at the back here. I can have my solar panel on top of them. And then when I'm underway, I simply pull the dinghy up and it hangs from those davits. But even that isn't quite enough because it will actually kind of move around in that in the slings kind of thing, in the bridle. So I do have extra slings that I've made that secures the dinghy to the push bit so that there's actually no movement at all. Um, I have found that being out in the strait in some rough weather when that dinghy starts to move around even though it's not necessarily going to lead to a catastrophe it's very distracting i'm worried about the dinghy i'm worried about what damage it might be um, succumbing to and that sort of thing so make sure anytime you secure a dinghy in davits make sure it's nice and solid i personally prefer not to have my engine on the dinghy in the davits i do have a bracket that i put my engine on um, a lot of cruisers in sheltered waters will tow dinghies and i think in very sheltered waters that that might be fine uh general rules are don't leave things in the dinghy don't leave a motor on it i do see people towing dinghies all the time i've had i've seen you know dinghies flip upside down be towed upside down in the in the straight in heavier weather so for me in open water i do not ever personally tow a dinghy if you don't have the luxury of davits and you can't tow a dinghy in heavier water or heavier uh, weather, I should say, uh, the only other option really is to have it on the foredeck or on some boats on the midship's deck underneath the boom. But most people will have their inflatable tenders tied down on the foredeck. So a couple of little points about that. Personally, I like to have my dinghy when I do tie it down to the foredeck, should I need that. Uh, I have one line going across from either from the stanchions or from the tow rail with something like a trucker's hitch, which can be released quickly, but just a single line, not a whole bunch of lines in case you need your, your boat as a life raft. If you don't have a life raft on your boat, if your boat's on fire or sinking and you need to abandon ship, you need to get that dinghy in the water quickly. So one quick release uh, knot will be you know, will, will be good to get your boat into the water, um, but you do want that knot to be secure. Um, the other thing is try to minimize, uh, I like to have the points facing backwards. It does fit the foredeck better anyway. It's more intuitive, but uh, at least it stops the sheets from getting quite as tangled up. But as I mentioned before, dinghies on the foredeck and kayaks on the side decks and stand-up paddle boards, I do find that to me, they just get in the way. So however you choose to do things, whatever you need to do, just be careful in heavier weather to have everything really properly stowed. And before you take off, make sure you do all your checks and hopefully that will keep you from ever getting into any sort of serious trouble that you won't be able to find your way out of. New episodes go up every second Wednesday at 6 p.m. See you next time when I go over international distress signals. Thanks for watching. Until then, I wish you all fair winds and following seas.